Guten Abend, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde, willkommen in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung bzw. willkommen zurück für all diejenigen von Ihnen, die schon tagsüber bei uns waren und äh, teilgenommen haben an unserer Syrien-Konferenz. Schön, dass Sie alle hier sind. Mein Name ist Bauke Baumann und ich bin Interimsreferatsleiter für Nahost und Nordafrika hier in der Böll-Stiftung. Nachdem wir heute schon sehr intensiv über den Konflikt in Syrien diskutiert haben, wollen wir unser Augenmerk nun noch einmal dezidiert auf den islamischen Staat, auf ISIS oder Daesh richten. Wir wollen versuchen, einen Blick in das Innenleben dieser Organisation zu werfen, um zu verstehen, welche Logik, welches Machtkalkül hinter den grausamen Gewaltinszenierungen steckt, die bei uns ankommen. Denn nur ein besseres Verständnis dieses für uns oft schwer verortenbaren, kaum fassbaren Organismus äh, kann der Ausgangspunkt sein für einen geeigneten Umgang mit bzw. eine geeignete Strategie der Bekämpfung von ISIS. Dies wurde bei den bisherigen Anstrengungen der internationalen Gemeinschaft meiner Meinung nach bisher viel zu wenig beachtet. Wir wissen eigentlich gar nicht richtig, wen wir da bekämpfen, habe ich manchmal den Eindruck. Ich freue mich daher sehr, dass wir heute Abend Christoph Reuter bei uns haben, der sein neues Buch »Die schwarze Macht, der islamische Staat und die Strategen des Terrors« vorstellen wird, das Ende April erschienen ist. Ich stelle dich noch kurz vor, <lacht> dann darfst du hier hochkommen. Christoph Reuter ist Korrespondent für den Spiegel und einer der letzten westlichen Journalisten, der weiterhin nach Syrien reist, um von dort vor Ort zu berichten. Und genau das zeichnet auch sein neues Buch aus, dessen Analysen auf fundierten Recherchen vor Ort basieren, auf Gesprächen mit Menschen in Syrien und im Irak und auf einmaligen Dokumenten aus dem Fundus von ISIS. Außerdem möchte ich herzlich begrüßen Petra Stienen, die als Publizistin und unabhängige Beraterin in Den Haag arbeitet. Petra Stienen war von 1995 bis 2004 niederländische Diplomatin und hat als solche auch in der Botschaft in Damaskus gearbeitet. Sie ist eine ausgewiesene Syrien-Expertin und wird nach der Buchvorstellung gemeinsam mit Christoph Reuter über die Implikationen seines Werks diskutieren. Die beiden werden sich auf Englisch unterhalten, das heißt... Wenn Sie noch Übersetzung benötigen, würde ich Sie bitten, sich noch draußen Kopfhörer zu holen. Und nun bitte begrüßen Sie mit mir Christoph Reuter. Ist es an? Ja. Ich werde erst auf Deutsch, weil bislang existiert das Buch nur auf Deutsch, ähm, eine recht szenische Passage vorlesen über den Mann, der, glaube ich, am spannendsten ist, wie wohl mittlerweile tot, ähm, nämlich den großen Strategen des islamischen Staates, über den wir sehr viel mehr wissen, als er jeder Welt mitteilen wollte, weil er bei seinem sehr unerwarteten Tod ähm, ein Fundus an Akten hinterlassen hat. Spröde sei er gewesen, zuvorkommend höflich, schmeichelnd, extrem aufmerksam, beherrscht, verlogen, undurchschaubar, bösartig. Jene Männer aus verschiedenen Orten Nordsyriens, die sich Monate später an ihre Begegnung mit ihm erinnern, schildern ganz unterschiedliche Facetten des Mannes. Nur in einem sind sie sich einig. Wir wussten nie, wem wir da eigentlich gegenüber sitzen. Und das in mehrfacher Hinsicht. Denn wer der hochgewachsene Endfünfziger mit dem kantigen Gesicht wirklich war, das wussten noch nicht einmal jene, die ihn an einem Januartag 2014 nach kurzem Feuergefecht im Ort Talrifat erschossen. Dass sie den strategischen Kopf des islamischen Staates umgebracht hatten, war ihnen nicht bewusst. Und dass es überhaupt geschehen konnte, war eine rare, aber letztlich fatale Fehlkalkulation des brillanten Zynikers. Den örtlichen Rebellen musste erst jemand erklären, wie wichtig der Mann gewesen war, bevor sie seinen Leichnam wieder aus der kaputten Kühltruhe hoben. Eigentlich hatten sie ihn daran begraben wollen. 
Samir Abdel Mohammed Al Khalifawi war der echte Name des Mannes, dessen knochige Züge von einem weißen Vollbart etwas gemildert wurden. Unter diesem Namen kannte ihn niemand. Aber auch mit Haji Bakr, seinem bekanntesten Pseudonym, wussten die wenigsten etwas anzufangen. Irgendwann Ende 2012 war der Iraker in der Umgebung von Aleppo aufgetaucht, Syriens nördlicher Wirtschaftsmetropole, um die ab dem Sommer desselben Jahres erbittert gekämpft wurde. Seit verschiedene Rebellengruppen die nahen Grenzübergänge eingenommen hatten, kam ein steter Strom ausländischer Dschihadisten über die türkische Grenze. Haji Bakr war schon länger da. Einer von vielen, die sich in dieser syrischen Zwischenwelt aufhielten, in der die Macht Bashar al-Assads bis auf kleine Inseln verschwunden war. Aber stattdessen gab es nicht eine neue Macht, sondern derer viele. Iraker kamen nur wenige, aber weder fiel Bakr als Kämpfer auf, noch machte er Anstalten, Anführer einer Rebellengruppe werden zu wollen, wie sie zu Dutzenden in jenen Tagen entstanden. Der alte Mann, der viel unterwegs war, hatte etwas ganz und gar anderes vor. Er wollte einen Staat errichten, mit dem ihm innewohnenden Anspruch auf die Weltherrschaft. So etwas ist nicht ganz einfach. Fast ein Jahrzehnt hatte der einstige Bars-Parteikader schon damit verbracht, eine Macht zu etablieren gegen die neuen Verhältnisse im Irak, die der früheren Elite des Landes ihre Stellung genommen hatten. Er war Geheimdienstoberst der Luftabwehr in Saddam Husseins Armee gewesen, zuständig kurioserweise unter anderem für Konzepte zur Rettung von Piloten notwassernder Militärjets. Bevor Saddam Hussein gestürzt, und die Armee per Dekret aufgelöst wurde. Bakker war daraufhin in den Untergrund gegangen. Um gegen die Amerikaner zu kämpfen, <lacht> hatte er die kurzlebigen Brigaden der Mars-Partei mitgegründet und war dann bei Al-Qaida gelandet. Erinnert sich der irakische Kenner der Dschihadisten, Hisham al-Hashimi, der ihn noch aus der Zeit vor Saddams Sturz kannte. Zitat, in Anbar einer Provinz im Westirak, lernte er Abu Musa al-Zarqawi kennen, den jordanischen Gründer von Al-Qaida im Irak. Aber ein Fanatiker oder Ideologe sei der Mann, der mit Hashimis Cousin an der Luftwaffenbasis Habania stationiert war, hingegen nicht gewesen, sondern schlicht verbittert darüber, per Federstrich des US-Statthalters Paul Bremer einfach auf die Straße gesetzt worden zu sein. Außerdem war Bakker ein überzeugter Nationalist, der fand, dass die amerikanischen Besatzer vertrieben gehörten. In der Eskalation des irakischen Bürgerkriegs folgte Haji Bakker dem Kurs Sarkawis. Noch erbitterter als die Amerikaner bekämpfte er die nunmehr herrschende Mehrheit der Schiiten. Ab 2006 verfolgte seine Bewegung den ambitionierten oder größenwahnsinnigen Plan, einen islamischen Staat zu errichten und hatte sich konsequent umbenannt in Islamischer Staat im Irak. Easy. Der Plan sei die Wiederauflage der Umma vor, der frühen Gemeinde des Propheten Mohammed, die nach beispiellos kurzen Eroberungszügen zum Imperium herangewachsen war. Ein solcher Staat, wie auch immer er aussehen würde, könnte aus dem Vollen der Überlieferungsgeschichte und Mythen schöpfen. Er wäre Projektionsfläche für all die Enttäuschten, zu kurz gekommenen und Wütenden in der islamischen Welt, denen man ein Heilsversprechen mit göttlichem Siegel präsentieren könnte. Auch andere hatten derartige Versuche schon vorher unternommen. Ob Osama Bin Laden, die Muslimbrüder, zig kleinere Dschihadistengrüppchen oder nationale Bewegungen wie die Taliban in Afghanistan. In allen schwebte stets als Endziel ein solcher Staat vor, wenn auch unterschiedlichen Ausmaßes. Und sie alle waren gescheitert. Auf die eine oder andere Weise. Die Taliban am Terror ihrer Al-Qaida-Gäste, die anderen an ihrer Unfähigkeit, mehr als einen Gebietszipfel zu erobern, den sie dann meist auch nur für kurze Zeit halten konnten, bevor sie vernichtend geschlagen wurden. Fehlschlag nach Fehlschlag. An einem von ihnen war Haji Bakr beteiligt. Denn auch im Irak, würde der Kampf von Al-Qaida spätestens 2010 zunächst scheitern, würden ihre Führer aufgerieben werden, Bakr überlebte. Ein ehemaliger Häftling des syrischen Gefängnisses Sednaya 
in dem die meisten islamistischen Häftlinge und vor allem die Rückkehrer aus dem Irak einsaßen, erinnert sich. Haji Bakr war bei Al-Qaida aufgetaucht, aber die meisten echten Islamisten misstrauten ihm. Schließlich war er ein Funktionär der Baspartei gewesen, ein hoher Offizier, rasiert, ein Saddam-Mann, kurz einer von denen, die sie früher ins Gefängnis gebracht hatten. Außerdem glaubte ihm keiner, dass er, so pl dass er plötzlich religiös geworden sei. Aber er hatte andere Qualitäten, so Hashimi. Er war ein begnadeter Planer und Logistiker, sehr organisiert, sehr klug. Ideologen hatte Al-Qaida ja ohnehin genügend. Woran es den religiösen Ultras stets gemangelt hatte, waren gewissermaßen die Ingenieure des Terrors, die zum Erfolg einer Operation, eines Sprengstoffattentats, einer Gefangenenbefreiung nicht auf Gottvertrauen setzten, sondern auf solide, umsichtige Vorbereitung. Solche Männer braucht auch die radikalste religiöse Terrorvereinigung. Gott schenkt einem nicht den Sieg, wenn man den Zünder vergisst oder am Mobiltelefon über Anschlagsdetails spricht und anschließend vom US-Militär mit einer Rakete eingeäschert wird. Die einzelnen Führer der Terrororganisation waren selten gemeinsam an einem Ort, kommunizierten oft über komplizierte, langwierige Umwege und kannten einander schlicht wenig. Haji Bakr war zuständig für die Kontakte zum Kreis um den einstigen irakischen Vizepräsidenten Isad al-Duri, der nach dem Sturz Saddam Husseins nie verhaftet worden war, als einziger aus der Führungsspitze. Von 2006 bis 2008 war Haji Bakr im berüchtigten irakischen Gefängnis Abu Ghraib und für eine Weile auch im US-Gefangenenlager Camp Bukka im Süden inhaftiert. Danach pendelte er gelegentlich nach Syrien, hatte nahe Damaskus eine Wohnung und soll sich dort mindestens einmal zwischen 2008 und 2010 mit Asif Schaukat getroffen haben, dem Chef des Militärgeheimdienstes, Schwager von Bashar al-Assad und Koordinator des diskreten Transfers von Dschihadisten aus aller Welt durch Syrien in den Irak. Bakr, <lacht> Bakr avancierte zu einem der militärischen Anführer des ISI, zuständig für die Provinz Anbar, dann zu dessen oberstem Militärchef, ernannt vom Anführer Abu Ayyub al-Masri. Als dieser und Sarkawis nomineller Nachfolger im Frühjahr 2010 von den Amerikanern gestellt wurden und sich lieber in die Luft sprengten, als aufzugeben, war es Haji Bakr, der dessen Nachfolger kürte. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, wie er sich nennt, ein enger Vertrauter noch aus den Jahren in Anbar. Bakr habe, so ein easy Gefolgsmann jener Zeit, die verbliebenen Mitglieder der obersten Räte einzeln gesprochen und ihnen jeweils die Zustimmung aller anderen versichert. Später dann seien drei Männer, die sich gegen ihn ausgesprochen hatten, spurlos verschwunden. Ob es letztlich die Machtübernahme der einstigen Bassisten oder die Lernkurve aller war, die überschaubare Schar der Anführer, die meisten waren von amerikanischen und irakischen Truppen nach und nach getötet worden, schien zu einem für religiöse Fanatiker ungewöhnlichen Schritt entschlossen, aus Fehlern zu lernen, eine Lehre zu ziehen aus all den Desastern der vergangenen Jahrzehnte, den fehlgeschlagenen Versuchen, irgendwo auf dem Wege des Dschihad an die Macht zu kommen und vor allem sich dort zu halten. So war Haji Bakke erneut nach Syrien gegangen, als Teil einer winzigen Vorhut und mit einem aberwitzigen Plan unter ihrer irakischen Führung eine Armee aus den anderen Ausländern zu bilden, die nun nach Syrien strömten. Das war ungefähr so, als würde sich eine Handvoll Österreicher in die Schweiz begeben, um dort mit einsickernden Deutschen die Macht an sich zu reißen. Doch die ambitiöse Umwegkonstruktion hatte einen Vorteil, der ihren Planern offenbar wichtig war. Unauffälligkeit. Explizit hatte Bakker verfügt, dass die irakischen Kämpfer des ISI bleiben sollten, wo sie waren, in Mosul, Tikrit, Hawija, den Hochburgen des sunnitischen Ressentiments gegen die Regierung in Bagdad. Während immer rigidere Apartheidspolitik, Kabinettsposten, Offiziersränge, Beamtenpositionen nur noch mit Schiiten zu besetzen, hatte zwar die Wut unter den Sunniten geschürt, die etwa ein Drittel der Bevölkerung ausmachten und die unter Saddam und in den Jahrzehnten zuvor die Herrscher des Landes gewesen waren. 
Aber noch existierte der irakische Staat und noch waren auch die verschiedenen militanten Gruppen zu uneins, ihm die Stirn zu bieten. Stets waren die Dschihadisten in den vergangenen Jahrzehnten in ihren eigenen Ländern an der jeweiligen Staatsmacht gescheitert. Im Irak ab 2003 hatten die einmarschierten Amerikaner zwar per Federstrich Armee, Regierung und Behörden aufgelöst, aber zugleich jeden späteren Versuch der Al-Qaida-Machtübernahme verhindert. Jede Bewegung der Radikalen in Ägypten, Libyen, in Syrien war in den letzten 30 Jahren fehlgeschlagen. Es war, als versuchten sie immer wieder aufs Neue durch einen Eisblock zu schwimmen. Doch in Syrien nun, jedenfalls im Norden, war die einst alles kontrollierende Staatsmacht bis auf Überbleibsel besiegt, vertrieben, zerschmolzen. An ihrer Stadt gab es hunderte von Ortsräten und Rebellenbrigaden. Es war ein anarchisches Nebeneinander, in dem niemand mehr die Übersicht hatte. Der geeignete Aggregatzustand für ein Projekt, das eine maßlose Glaubensvision erforderte oder eben solchen Zynismus oder beides. In Syrien, wo sich Haji Bakr und die übrigen entsandten Führungskader ausweislich der Koordinaten seines Navigationsgerätes erst einmal in den kaum kontrollierten, menschenarmen Steppen der Ostprovinz Hassaka einrichteten, fehlt es allerdings zu einer schlichten militärischen Unterwerfung der potenziellen Untertanen an so ziemlich allem, was dafür nötig gewesen wäre. Männern, Waffen und vor allem Lokalkenntnissen. Wer könnte dem islamischen Staat zugeneigt sein? Wer bliebe auf jeden Fall Gegner? Wer besaß Charisma, Geld, informelle Führungspositionen? Und wo wohnten diese Leute? Dies würden die Dschihadisten als erstes in Erfahrung bringen. Sie hatten Geld, das sie seit Jahren vor allem mit einem engmaschigen Netz von Schutzgelderpressungen in der irakischen Handelsmetropole Mosul verdienten, ihrer Hochburg. Und sie hatten einen Plan, den Haji Bakr begann, Blatt um Blatt aufzuzeichnen für die ersten kleinen Schritte zur Machtergreifung. Denn jetzt hatten sie keinen Eisblock mehr vor sich, sondern Wasser, in dem sie sich wie Fische bewegen konnten. Im Tosen des Krieges saß der Herr der Schatten, wie Haji Bakker auch einmal bezeichnet wurde, in der ruhigen Kleinstadt Tel Arifat und schrieb. Er skizzierte die Verwaltungsstruktur eines Staates bis auf Ortsebene. Er stellte Listen zur schleichenden, unbemerkten Infiltration von Dörfern, entwarf Zuständigkeiten, wer wen überwachen sollte. Mit Kugelschreiber zeichnete er die Befehlsketten des Sicherheitsapparates auf Papier. Das stammte vermutlich ein Zufall, vom syrischen Verteidigungsministerium mit Briefkopf der Abteilung Unterkünfte und Immobilien. Was Haji Bakker entwarf und was in den folgenden Monaten erstaunlich akkurat umgesetzt wurde, war kein Glaubensmanifest, sondern der technisch präzise entworfene Bauplan für einen islamischen Geheimdienststaat, ein Stasi-Kalifat. Der Plan zur Unterwerfung Nordsyriens begann mit demselben Detail für jeden Ort, unter dem Vorwand, ein Dauerbüro, ein islamisches Missionszentrum zu öffnen, sollten aus jedem Dorf willige und intelligente Gefolgsleute angeworben werden. Aus jenen, die zu Vorträgen und Kursen zum rechtgeleiteten islamischen Leben kämen, sollten ein oder zwei ausgewählt werden, ihr Dorf bis in die letzte Phase auszuspionieren. Dafür erstellte Haji Bakr eine Liste. Zähle die machtvollen Familien auf. Benenne die mächtigen Personen in diesen Familien. Finde ihre Einkommensquellen heraus. Nenne Namen und Mannstärke der Rebellenbrigaden im Dorf. Sammle die Namen ihrer Anführer, wer sie kontrolliert, ihre politische Orientierung. Eruiere ihre illegalen, in Klammern gemäß Scharia, Aktivitäten heraus, mit denen wir sie im Bedarfsfall erpressen können. Falls mithin jemand kriminell war, schwul, eine geheime Affäre hatte, sollten all diese Details als kompromittierende Druckmittel gesammelt werden. Zitat, die Klügsten machen wir zu Scharia-Sheikhs, hatte Haji Bakr angemerkt. Und wir werden sie dann noch eine Weile trainieren und sie dann losschicken. Als PS war der Hinweis angefügt, dass jeweils mehrere Brüder ausgewählt würden zu versuchen, Töchter der wichtigsten Familien zu heiraten, um, Zitat, die Durchdringung dieser Familien sicherzustellen, ohne dass diese überhaupt davon wissen. 
Die Kundschafter sollten über ein Zieldorf möglichst alles in Erfahrung bringen. Wer dort wohnt, wer das Sagen hat, welche Familien religiös seien, welcher islamischen Rechtsschule sie angehörten, wie viele Moscheen es gebe, wer der Imam sei, wie viele Frauen und Kinder er habe und wie alt diese seien, wie seine Predigten seien, ob er eher der Mystiker-Variante den Sufis zuneige, ob er auf Seiten der Opposition stehe oder des Regimes und wie seine Position gegenüber dem Dschihad sei. Dann, ob der Imam ein Einkommen beziehe, falls ja, von wem? Und zu welchen Familien gehörten diese Unterstützer? Wählen sie den Imam aus oder wer beruft ihn ins Amt? Und schließlich, wie viele Demokraten gibt es im Dorf? Wie seismische Signalwellen sollten die Prediger-Agenten funktionieren? Ausgeschickt, noch kleinste Risse, uralte Verwerfungen in den tiefen Schichten der Gesellschaft aufzuspüren und alles zu nutzen, was deren Spaltung und Unterwerfung dienlich sein könnte. Für manche Dorfer und Kleinstädte, wie Tal Rifat, war der Prozess der Informationsgewinnung offensichtlich schon vorangeschritten. In den Papieren von Haji Bakr finden sich Listen der örtlichen Informanten, die meisten Anfang 20, aber andere auch erst 16 oder 17 Jahre alt. In den Plänen, in denen er die Verwaltung des künftigen Staates skizzierte, kamen zwar auch Bereiche vor wie Finanzen, Schulen, Kindergärten, Medien, Transportwesen. Aber immer wieder ging es um das Kernthema, das in Organigrammen und Listen für Zuständigkeiten und Berichtspflichten akribisch abgehandelt wurde. Überwachung, Spionage, Morde, Entführung. Für jeden Schurerat, ein allgemeines Aufsichts- oder Beratungsgremium und die zentrale Verwaltungsinstanz, hatte Haji Bakr einen Emir, einen Befehlshaber, für Ermordungen, einen Emir für Entführungen, einen für die Scharfschützen, einen für Kommunikation und Verschlüsselung, sowie einen Emir zur Überwachung der anderen Emire vorgesehen, Zitat, falls sie ihre Arbeit nicht gut machen. Die Keimzelle dieses gottgefälligen Staates würde das teuflische Räderwerk einer Zellen- und Kommandostruktur sein, die bodenlose Furcht verbreitet. Von Anfang an geplant war, dass die Geheimdienste parallel arbeiten, selbst auf Provinzebene. Eine allgemeine Nachrichtendienstabteilung unterstand dem Sicherheitsemir einer Region, der Vizeemire für die einzelnen Bezirke befehligt. Jedem von diesen wiederum unterstanden sowohl ein Führer geheimer Spionagezellen wie ein Nachrichtendienst- und Informationsmanager des Bezirks. Die Spionagezellen auf der Ortsebene waren gesondert dem Stellvertreter des Bezirksemirs untergeordnet. Kurz, jeder würde jeden überwachen. Die Verantwortlichen für Gefängnisse und Verhöre sowie für die Ausbildung der, Zitat, Scharia-Richter in geheimdienstlicher Informationsgewinnung waren nochmal ausgegliedert und unterstanden ebenfalls dem Bezirksemir. Während eine separate Abteilung der Sicherheitsoffiziere direkt dem regionalen Emir zugeordnet war. Scharia, Gerichtsbarkeit, alles war nur Mittel zum Zweck, unterworfen einem einzigen Ziel. Überwachung und Bespitzelung. Selbst das Wort, das Haji Bakr für die Schaffung der echten Muslime benutzte, Taqwim, ist kein religiöser, sondern ein technischer Begriff, der die Implementierung von etwas bezeichnet. Ein unvoreingenommener Betrachter könnte den Eindruck gewinnen, George Orwell hätte Pate gestanden, diese Ausgeburt paranoider Kontrolle seiner Form zu geben. Aber es war viel simpler. Samir Abdel Mohammed El Khlefavi, alias Haji Bakr, modifizierte lediglich, womit er groß geworden war. Saddam Husseins allumfassenden Geheimdienstapparat, in dem sich niemand, auch kein Geheimdienstgeneral, je sicher sein konnte, nicht seinerseits bespitzelt zu werden. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue in English. My name is Petra Steenen. And um, thanks to Christoph um, and Bente, I did something I did not intend the last year. I did not want to read about Daesh, about ISIS, because I thought it would make me feel sick, make me feel horrible. I was basically looking away like so many other people. 
And then I read your book of Deutsch. <laughs> and um, I have to compliment you on many levels. But I think it's amazing. I told Christoph before, if he ever fails as a journalist, he can definitely start working as a scenario writer for Hollywood movies. <laughs> and you have this amazing sense of understated humor that made it bearable to read the book. Because, of course, the subject matter is tough. Um, before I go into the content of the book and also into the chapter you just, or part of the chapter you just read about the, 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 the treasure you found in a way, that must be a reporter's dream <laughs> to find a treasure like that, I have a few general questions because I know you probably don't want to talk about yourself. You want to talk about ISIS and about Daesh and about what you found. But I think for the audience, it's interesting to know a little bit more about how you worked. Um, I think contrary to many of the journalists and authors and commentators who write about Daesh, I like to do Daesh and ISIS sort of we'll go into it, but let's, um, stick to well, let's stick to Daesh and make them upset. <laughs> and I put my legs like this and then they are even more upset. Um, this is my way of dealing with Daesh, you know, have fun. And um, You went to Syria how many times? By now, since 2011, 19 times. 19 times. Yeah. Um, well, it's not tourism like some other people might have suggested today for you. <laughs> Definitely not. How did it work? I mean, how did you go into Syria? What, tell us, take us on your journey, a typical one. Well, it changed, it morphed. The, the early trips... Um, in 2011, where it was still possible to enter Syria on a visa, where as a foreigner you were still kind of normal, I, uh, I entered on a visa, but not as a journalist, but as an um, <laughs> expert on agriculture. Precisely Wasn't it a certain, a certain type of bug? Pest control, which comes close to the idea of the regime, how to deal with the opposition. Um, and it worked extremely well because it was so absurd that nobody, uh, nobody doubted it. So I went in, I think, three times until um, December 11, where we were in Baba Amr in this first quarter of Homs, which was under complete control of armed rebels by then. The first tiny, tiny, tiny area, uh, which was completely raided and half destroyed by the army later. And unfortunately one of the very courageous local activists who had, had helped us to get in, got arrested and uh, after weeks of unbearable torture, released everything he knew about all journalists he had helped, Paul Woods, um, some Spanish colleagues, me and the photographer. And since then, no more visa. We had for the first... He didn't like to be called pest. No. no. For the first Fair months, enough. all stories appeared without byline, and uh, the Syrian embassy was very keen to find out who are the people from Spiegel who go in. So basically, they lured other journalists, you get a visa if you tell us who goes in from the Spiegel. Two of them were, because they were not diplomats, they were later arrested for uh, espionage. And then it was basically crossing the borders, crossing the borders from Turkey, um, legal, illegal, it... In German, you could use the term scheißegal. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't matter for the first months or the first year because the, the Turkish authorities were basically overwhelmed and uh, sometimes arrested us for an hour, sometimes told us, not here. 50 meters away, we have no infrared cameras. Just cross there. Or they just said, you go in, God be with you, good luck. Um, and later, they, when the, the rebels took over, we could use the border crossings. Iraq, rather the same. Lebanon, the same. Jordan, to our surprise, it was impossible um, to get in. But yeah, I would always cover the, the liberated, the rebel areas, um, basically going from the Turkish border within 12 days until Homs. And for me, knowing that you have been there yourself... Um I wonder whether that is the reason why you, in the book, try to make the reader aware, don't take everything for granted that the Dash propaganda machine puts out there. For me, that's very much a red line in the book. It's like, 
many people in the Western media who write about Daesh, ISIS, what's happening, have never been there. And it's sort of, it's almost as if they taking, copy pasting whatever the propaganda machine gives to them, very slick videos, very slick propaganda material. But you put big question marks in your book. And I think somehow related to your travels because you have seen different things. Uh, yeah, well, we saw the, the propaganda of the regime, we saw the propaganda of, uh, of Daesh, uh, but th the point was already before we found the files, before mm -hmm. we found the papers, um, in 2000, late 12, 2013, there were very spooky elements that uh, local activists in areas where jihadis, they didn't even know it was Daesh or later Daesh was operating. They told us, there are Tunisians who know everything. There are Egyptians who know everything. They know where we live. They know, uh, they know our secret backup uh, address. There, there must be some institution which is feeding them with all information about our, our secrets, our details. Uh, and they are foreigners, the guys. Or... Uh, People were kidnapped, and uh, again, people wondered how how could it happen? How did they know that he's crossing from there to there to there? Um, or you had these camps where the jihadis claimed we're just brothers. We came to to help. Dawa. Uh, dawa. Yani yeah, dawa musallaha. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dawa with arms. But these camps were extremely well organized. Every few days, the next trainer would come for sniping for this, for this, for this. Um, there was food stuff. And they didn't let us enter, never. And again, you had the impression there is something in somewhere organizing things. So the idea of just jihad is coming, uh, we doubted it. Mm -hmm. so and then you found this treasure of documents. What I want to do in much this... Much later. Much later, yeah, much later. But what I want to do in this interview, and then we come to you, the audience, is basically look at the origins of Daesh, of ISIS, and also look at their workings and how we have reacted to it. So sort of making it a little bit uh, structured, but please uh, talk about whatever you want to add. Um, these documents you found later, how do you know they're authentic? Because we know that they are amazingly well organized in their propaganda, and I saw some of the documents, and I recommend the audience to read, of course, the book, but also the article you published in Der Spiegel. And you see, you know, the script, the handwriting and everything, and it looks a bit amateuristic on the one hand, but very precise on the other hand. But how do we know that these documents are authentic? Well, it was a long process. We had, uh, and even here in the audience, uh, two Syrians who today recognized me uh, from the trips to Minbij, to Zabadani, I mean... We have local informers, assistants, people who tell us if something happens. Um, basically, in each and every town and big villages of Idlib province, Halle province and other areas. So when the fighting broke out between Daesh and the Syrian rebels, who were fed up with getting kidnapped and killed um, under the pretext of we just take out criminal elements, um, when they finally united stood up against Daesh. Um, Haji Bakr had outsmarted himself because he had lived in a very unconspicuous, low-profile private house in this town of Tarifat, where there was a heavy Daesh presence, but he had not stayed in the headquarter. And suddenly the fighting erupted. Half the city or half the town was taken over by rebels. He lived in the wrong half. And then the master of snitches was basically snitched by one of his neighbors who told the rebels, there is Dashi Sheikh in the next house. They wanted to arrest him. He started shooting. They shot him. And uh, as mentioned, they didn't know whom they had there. It's a, it's a rural town. Um, and he had kept a very low profile, at least in his, uh, in his area. So we heard about the papers like six weeks later that one of our contacts told us, by the way, when the guy got killed, and this was kind of confirmed, even Daesh confirmed that he was killed, he left behind papers. Uh, and two guys whom we found out we knew already since a long time, uh, or one of our researchers, he had kept them. I said, well, okay, well, what kind of papers? I said, well, handwritten drafts, planning, sounds Basi, but not Syrian Basi, weird wording. 
Um, so we negotiated to see uh, first page, and after at all seven months, we went to Tarifat um, and checked the circumstances of finding of the conflict. Um, uh, checked with uh, when we had the papers. Checked with other handwritten notes from other negotiations of Haji Bakr um, with rebel leaders. If this is his handwriting, and uh, had no reason to doubt the authenticity of the papers. Plus, the guys had never had the intention to to publish them, to give them away. They were a bit paranoid that when Daesh finds out they have them, they will kill them all. So it took a long time to persuade them, give them to us, make them public, we will never reveal your, um, your identity. Um, and then when we saw these this plans, how to crack open the village, this is the wording, um, with these offices, we went to 15, 16 towns, villages, or checked with the people we know personally, how did Daesh come to your place? And everywhere it was the same story. And there was a little office. There was a little house they rented for the brothers, for the jihadis, or straight for, for Daj a bit later. But they always started in a peaceful, friendly way of missionary work. And then later the kidnapping started, the killing started. Um, so we found that these drafts were not only authentic, but they were the real plan which had been implemented. Because the sudden rise of Daesh was a miracle to most people. But did those papers confirm things? Because you found, at what, which moment did you get those papers? This was last year. November. November, November we went to Tarifa yeah, yeah. and uh, went through the whole trove. Because you were uh, already writing your book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. for this part, we again went uh, to the places uh, or had asked the people whom we know already. Yeah. Uh, one was our neighbor in Beirut from Atarab. It was very easy to ask him, okay. how did it start? Because everybody had forgotten about the beginnings. Everybody knew the later stage, but how did it start? That in an area where there is no dash, suddenly there is dash. But did those papers confirm things you already found out? Which papers? The paper, the, 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 yeah, yeah, your, your no, treasure they papers. Confirmed, well, <laughs> they confirmed uh, suspicions we had had, or they basically explained uh, suspicions. Uh, yeah, well, let's call it suspicions. Um, but we had never expected that on such an industrial scale, on the same, with the same procedure, with the same plan, step A, B, C, D, mm. they implemented it from Western Idlib up to Hasaka and other areas in the east. Because let's go to one of those cities. Yeah, but let me just finish. Sorry, this yeah. is because then uh, the one, the nice thing is there was a second trove of files from the headquarters in Halab, the implementation report, basically, and sometimes they exactly referred to things which were demanded. Uh, or written in the first plans, like we should marry secretly into the influential families. And then in the second trove, there was a long list of jihadis, of their men, applying not only to marry, but applying to Daesh that they needed some supplementary equipment, not only a wife, but a wife and a full automatic washing machine, a wife <laughs> and furniture. Who doesn't? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So we had several layers of confirmation that uh, the papers are authentic, but also they are the real plan. Now back to the play. Well, I mean, for me, being somebody who is following what's happening in Syria more or less on a daily basis, although I was turning away from all this dash things, all of a sudden last year, Raqqa was... Well, was, yeah, it was last year, 2014, wasn't it? 2013. Raqqa was conquered by ISIS. 13 the first time, yeah. 14 the second. Yeah. yeah. But now knowing what we know, there was no surprise at all no. for you. No. Um, Raqqa was like the, the perfect example how they conquer a city uh, while they were never the biggest military force how you first destruct, destabilize it from within, how you kidnap there the head of the local council, um, then attack specific uh, rebel units while having secret deals with all the other units, 
called Beya Harbi, that you don't attack each other. Mm. So all the other units thought, oh, it's not about us, it's just about them. And then they took out the next and the That's next. That's what surprised me, and then I don't know how many people are here, actually. Who, who has ever been to Syria? I think it's good for us to know. There are quite knowledgeable people in the room. That's good <laughs> to know. And anybody who has been to Raqqa? Wow. Okay. That's quite, Damn. yeah. Well, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I have been to Raqqa several times and it didn't strike me as the most conservative city in Syria. No, 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 no. Not at all, huh? No, it was the city of Brussels. Well, that's what you're seeing. I don't know. I haven't been there. But <laughs> <laughs> have you? No, I, don't, I didn't that's try. That's called investigating but, uh, <laughs> journalism, huh? <laughs> no, they were close when we came. But uh, no, Raqqa <laughs> was a city of, how you call this in English? Eine Stadt ohne Eigenschaften. Uh, and, um, the city without characteristics. They were. They had a provincial a high town. Let's be nice to them. Provincial. But they town. said it themselves. Yeah. They were neither into religion very much, nor were they fierce loyalists of the party. They had a high number of bars members, but there was no big general coming from Raqqa. There was nothing specific on Raqqa. Um, and in a way. When the rebels came in first, everything was possible in Raqqa. You had Capoeira, a Capoeira group there. You had wonderful initiatives. Uh, Hakakuna, the, the movement for our rights, youth groups. Everything was possible in Raqqa. And some people later claimed because everything was possible, also Daesh was possible in Raqqa. And could finally take it all because there was no organized, unified resistance against mm. it. And it's uh, Yassin Haj Saleh's uh, yeah. hometown as Whose well. His brother huh? got uh, yeah, kidnapped yeah. and vanished. We uh, in the media see all those flags and slogans and, you know, the tsunami of jihadis. And in your book you say, well, we have to look beyond all of these symbols. There's something else there behind that. Are we mistaken by taking those symbols and slogans and flags? I remember Dutch journalists being very proud that they took pictures of the first black flags. You see, now the jihadists have arrived. What's with the flags? Well, I had uh, a discussion even with our at Spiegel, our picture editor, that uh, said, well, we, we have pictures from inside Daesh areas which are not taken by Daesh. And you would have a scrappy, shitty little iPhone, smartphone picture of somebody moving somewhere. And the picture editor said, this is a shitty picture. I said, yeah, but this is authentic, non dash <laughs> picture. And he said, yeah, but we have these, you know, these 50 Humvees with lights open and guns up. And everybody loves these pictures. And these pictures come straight, basically, from the PR department of Daesh or from the few photographers who have the permission to work under Daesh after they have sworn a giants and know that they will be beheaded if they publish any picture which Daesh doesn't like. Respectively, they have to give all their material to Daesh for getting the, uh, the stamp of approval. And then they can send it to Reuters, AFP, AP, etc. So it's an agency picture, but basically it's the PR picture of Daesh. Daesh is controlling perfectly their image. You know, I was wondering when I read your book and also when I, I'm not, this is an, I don't know whether you share this hesitation, when you click on those YouTubes they send around, then you give them credibility and legitimacy as well. So I find that a bit of a, it's like, of course, I mean, I, I'm not so curious of the beheadings. Um, but you, you know, as a researcher or as a commentator, you want to know what they write about. And um, who is running their media office? Do we know? It's a good question. Um, we don't know. I don't know precisely. Because it who looks really, really, really specialized. It's extremely well specialized. You have, uh, for example, when you had the so-called beheading video of uh, James Foley, this is not a beheading video. Uh, I watched it, or we watched it again and again and again and again, uh, not because we liked it, but you don't see the beheading. They use the same technique Hitchcock would use for his movies, that you don't show the stabbing, you don't show the deed. You stop, and then you come to the result. You see the severed head of James Foley, the rest is left to the fantasy of the viewer, plus you spare the Western viewer the view of the, the cutting. So it's extremely well 
fine-tuned for a specific audience, while other videos for the local audience, they are splatter videos for the locals who are forced into submission. They show the complete beheading, they show the humiliation of the guys. Oh, f fleshy cheeks, don't, don't laugh or don't cry because I'll cut your head in a minute. And then you see the whole process uh, of knife going through bones and flesh for like 15 minutes. And this was meant for the local audience. This It's almost uh, jihadi pornography. Yeah, yeah. But they fine-tuned for Western audience, you get this version. For the local audience, you get this version. Um, they are very thoughtful how to present which message. But after or behind, behind all the, the propaganda, all these constant Quranic recitations, etc., etc., you find something, as we found in the plans, where there is no Islamic reference at all. Yeah, when you were reading the text, I remember that you called it the Stasi Caliphate. And the Stasi Caliphate, meaning a well-organized mechanism to control, to oppress, and to look for power. More than salvation in the hereafter. No, 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 no. They're not oh, no salvation here in the hereafter? For uh, hereafter is for the enemies or for the victims. Yeah. Uh, no, if you take Al-Qaeda, for example, mm -hmm. they had, uh, may sound strange, but they had a romantic approach. They had the idea that through terror, through bombings, we will weaken the imperial powers as the USA, etc. We will weaken our own dictatorships and then the Islamic masses will rise up stand up against uh, oppression and will ask for the Islamic State, will cheer us, etc., etc., which they never did. But the, the view Al-Qaeda had of, of mankind, of people, was at the end a rather democratic idea of people decide about their own fate. And Daesh has a completely different view. Daesh thinks of people like sheep. You have to make sure they surrender, you have to force them into submission, and then they will obey. Yeah, and somewhere you write, um, and Nusra, Jabhat and Nusra has an ideology, and Daesh has a state. Yeah, yeah. this is the, the great pain for Jabhat and Nusra, and this is the, the kind of the cycle that uh, the Daesh is told everybody, listen, you, you may be jihadi, but you know, you are a you have a, a project, you may have an idea, you have a strategy, but see, we have the state. We are like uh, one step further uh, with implementation of God's will. We are the implementers of God's commands and the state. Although it was first formed by declaration at the early stage, the state is something nobody else had. I liked the part when you wrote the development or liked, I, f I was fascinated, I didn't know that, that the guy we all associate with the state, al-Baghdadi, that you read somewhere, uh, they didn't find the poster boy yet, so they made the poster first. It was the predecessor. Yeah, that was the predecessor. That was the predecessor. But there, there was a rumor about a guy called al-Baghdadi for a long time, and then this one person, if I understood correctly... Yeah, yeah. Well, the fascinating thing, which also might apply for Mr. Jolani of the Nusra Front, is that in these secretive clandestine circles where everybody is using a fake name and you cannot really meet all 10 people together because you might be hit by a missile, it obviously was easy that when, after the Jordanian Zarqawi was killed, the Egyptian al-Masri wanted to take over and they needed an Iraqi. It was an Iraqi movement, so they thought, okay, we need an Iraqi. So we, yeah, the poster boy, we, uh, we swear allegiance to Abu Omar al-Baghdadi. Nobody knew Abu Omar al-Baghdadi because nobody existed. It was a role which was filled for about one, one and a half years by various persons, but everybody agreed to the idea. Al-Qaeda uh, in, uh, in Pakistan had nothing against it, um, the upper leadership thought, yeah, it makes sense. We need an Iraqi. So everybody could swear allegiance to Abu Omar al-Baghdadi. And only in the last stage, it was one and the same person who filled this role 
and then was killed by the Americans or blew himself up in 2010. But this is something which is possible in these circles. They are absolutely non-transparent, so they can do a lot of things, make us believe or make their own followers believe that something is going on which is not really happening. If you talk to Dashis or to Nusra people, so who is your leader? He would say, my emir, my local emir. Okay, and above the emir, well, I'm above. I, I, I don't know, I'm not supposed to know. They know that there's the caliph at the end, but they don't know the real structure. Mm. And Daesh is perfect with, you have a military structure, and then you have kind of special forces in the background. You have an official council, but then you have a kind of secret council, the man of losing and tighting, um, which is really taking the decisions. You have military leader like Omar al-Shishani, but he is not taking the real decision. Uh, so you always have two layers with Daesh, the surface and something that comes behind. Let's go to the workings of Daesh and the attraction of Daesh also for foreigners who come and join. Um, and one of the big differences, of course, when you look at Al-Qaeda and Daesh, even though Al-Qaeda hasn't really managed, we don't know due to what reasons, inner disorganization or good security work of our services, that can be discussed. But the question, and you raised this in your book as well, is like, why did Daesh not yet make this big attack? Um, but that, because that would be a great propaganda stunt, wouldn't it? Do they, they don't need it? They are attractive enough. See, when you want to uh, to understand the the calculus of Daesh, you can take look, for example, at the hostages. They were collecting, as other people would collect stamps, stamps or yeah. butterflies. <laughs> um, they would collect Western hostages. At the, the maximum, they had more than 30 journalists, aid workers, um, ICRC people. Neither they would give any sign of life, nor would they ask for ransom money, nor would they uh, PR effectively um, if, uh, behead or show someone like this guy is in our, um, our force. Um, they would kim simply store them, store them secretly for later use. And since I was involved in uh, research over months to find out about the three German green helmets who were kidnapped, we talked also with the, the, the uh, kidnapping experts and the federal police and others, and they said, we have never had such a case where a group is putting a lot of energy, a lot of effort into kidnapping people, and that we don't know what happens with them. They had a plan, and they had patience, uh, strategically waiting, what should we do with these hostages? And after one year, or sometimes even longer, they started to sell some, and when they needed to answer to the first bombing campaign in August last year, then suddenly uh, they showed James Foley and the others and... Uh, put their uh, the killing, the assassination on display. Before, nothing. Um, so you see that their way of thinking, of planning, of uh, taking decisions is a very cold, calculated way. And the same applies to bombing. What is a terror attack? It gets you into the prime news. But then what? Mm. Does it help you in expansion? No, it creates a lot of enemies. It creates some following as well. You have some pros and cons for a terror attack. Um, so it seems that for now, the priority is not on a terror attack in the West. They could do. They could do probably within two days uh, all over Europe. They have, the, they have the infrastructure, they have the people, they are working on various kinds of weapons. Because I understand from your writings that what happened in Charlie Hebdo and in Copenhagen, those were self-proclaimed... Daesh supporters, but we don't know whether they were directed from some central command. There Do is we? no... Well, I mean, I, I'm not a French intelligence, but there is no indication that they were directed by a group. 
I mean, somebody who has to go, like Koulibaly, the guy who uh, took the hostage in the supermarket, who has to go to his local bank to get a loan and to drive to the black market in Brussels and buy Kalashnikovs there, it does not sound for uh, very proper preparation. And taking all the horror of the Charlie Hebdo attack into consideration, um, these guys managed to go in at the right day. First they missed the house, but then they found the right house killed the people. But everything that came later was very unprofessional. Was extremely amateurish and confusing. Mm. Uh, and there was no, no real link found that anything had been preordained, pre organized. If this had been the case, there would probably have been a video of uh, the Quachi brothers, Kulibali, with somebody from the from Daesh or from Al Qaeda in Yemen, uh, which at least were the, the area where two of these guys were years back for a short training uh, period. No. Actually, your point that this is a very organized Stasi-like, Baathi-like organization that is more rational than most of us in the West could imagine. Looking at the way people write about Daesh, you know, being fanatic, uh, being an apocalyptic movement. I I forgot his name, the French journalist who was released. Um, yeah, there was one. Uh, well, he he was, he was interviewed and he said, all this time I was with them, I did not hear them read one single verse from the Quran. Well, I mean... There is a reason why, uh, for example, two of the guys who I think came from the UK, one of the things they bought online before they ventured into the caliphate was the Quran for dummies. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's not religious scholars going to Daesh. There are many reasons to join them, to have a new identity, to feel empowered. It's something for people with sadistic tendencies who like to kill or to humiliate. Um, can be money in some cases, but you are part of a force which can act with violence and impunity. Mm. This is what matters much more than religious considerations. They have people who can do this. I mean, if you read Darbeck, the magazine, if you see their proclamations, there are no mistakes in Quranic uh, citations. Um, they can do this, but for rank and file followers. Uh, Maybe it's good oh. for the audience who doesn't know, but Dabik has a special meaning. Also, eh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm asking you, Dabik has a special meaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the um, it's the place or one of the places for the apocalyptic final battle. Mm -hmm. or and one of the and it is in Syria somewhere. Yeah, Where, it's a little village in, close yeah. to uh, close to Aleppo. Close to Aleppo, yeah. Um, where actually we found uh, in 2012, there was the first meeting of Democrats from different villages who discussed about the future of Syria. This was in real Dabek, in the old building of the Baas uh, party. Yeah. But one, of, one of our famous uh, politicians called Geert Wilders is now has a whole page in Dabek. So it's weird how somehow the extreme right and... Islamist jihadis uh, feed on each other because, of course, I am shocked by the way a politician in the Netherlands needs to be protected because of the threats. Huh? I mean, I'm not I'm not dismissive at all about what could happen. We have seen that people are willing to kill politicians because of their ideas, and of course, that's nev ne never, never, I would want that to happen to Geert Wilders. But at the same time, it's sort of makes him even more important that he is in Dabek. And Daj would not want to kill Gerd Wilders. Daj would probably uh, like Check. Gerd Wilders because they are, and what you said is touching the relation, let's say, between the Islam haters and Daj, also between the Assad regime and Daj, or between the... It's a strange menage a trois, huh, in a way. Yeah. Because you have enemies which are useful to each other. Because always you have the this... The frenemies of Hanin. Yeah, exactly. What uh, you said earlier, um, you have a triangular relation. You have, uh, for example, in Syria, you have Assad's regime and Daesh, who are official enemies. 
But for Assad, it's perfect to have Daesh as an enemy because he can tell the world, see, these guys are fanatic, crazy beheaders. They are wash. They are monsters. Take me. I'm much nicer. Yeah, um, it's the, it's while the both try to fight the Syrian rebels, um, and we, we collected military details, for example, where you had uh, Daesh and rebels fighting in the north, and then Assad's air force came in always bombing the rebels. You had an air force for rent, a borrowed air force, Assad's air force and the jihadis on the ground. Um, you have this, and this is what people here often do not understand because it's so strange that you do not have two enemies. You have three enemies and two of them, in Iraq and in Syria, it's the, the leadership of the state, who like the jihadis because the jihadis are useful enemies. And for the jihadis, it's useful to have a very tolerant state uh, who does not supply, like in the Ramadi, the forces there, or who helps out with a little bit of the air force. Or for Gerd Wilders, uh, it's perfect, because the more hated normal, average Muslim citizens in the Netherlands will feel, the more of them would say, okay, they hate us anyhow, so we should hate back. Daesh and the Gerd Wilders are kind of reciproc elements which leave no space for the middle ground. Let's go back to the population in Syria and in some of the towns in Iraq well, who, well, when you, you describe it in a way that I wish it was science fiction, but it's unfortunately reality, they don't allow anything. You know, they have ruled out any fun, any schooling, any healthcare, anything in many of the cities there. Or did I get that wrong? No, no, the health the healthcare is not ruled out, except as a woman you cannot go there without your husband, your father or your son. But they have ruled out all fun. Plus all fun. canned meat, plus frozen chicken. Where but they we get don't Nutella, know. I read that. They have Nutella. But uh, But it's an interesting <laughs> thing. Because yes. um, for, for jihadi outlets normally, it was the, the element of self-destruction. If you ban everything, which obviously for a lot in this jihadi movement, it gives, it gives them a kick. Mm -hmm. That you can't tell people, this is forbidden, this is forbidden, this is forbidden, and I will punish you if you did this, 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 this. Um, people feel suffocated. People feel they, they, they cannot stand it anymore and they will resist even if it costs them their but life. But there is very little resistance from the local population. Yeah, because coming back to the plan of we implement the perfect intelligence state, mm -hmm. people who told us, who came out of Daesh area or who were still communicating with us, I'm afraid of my son. I'm afraid of the neighbor's son. I'm afraid of talking in the courtyard of these mm -hmm. two, three houses because Daesh has ears everywhere. Um... People are afraid to get organized. People have a few weapons left. Um, people have few funds left. People cannot move freely because even their movements are controlled. And you need special cards, special passes to leave this area, to move to the next area. It's, it's like North Korea with goats. Um, yeah, as you say in your book, North Korean and, and Arabic. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean... If you see in, in many media pieces, it is proclaimed that, okay, people are very angry with Daesh, which they are. They are unhappy. They are suffering. Yes, perfectly true. So they will resist. No, they will not, because they cannot. They would love to. But you had under Stalin or under Mao, you had millions of people dying of starvation. They for sure would have resisted, but they couldn't. Um, what's there as, you say, okay, Ladies and gentlemen, be careful. Don't think that this is some kind of lunatic movement that goes on ideology and apocalyptic views of the world and paradise in the hereafter. They have a strong calculus. They know what they want. What do they want? I think from what we see and how they are benefiting from the hate of the others, um, at the end, they want to transform themselves from being what they are now still a kind of terrorist organization which has few friends and which you could still leave, theoretically at least, you could leave it without giving up your identity um, to morph into the one group in the apocalyptic war between the Sunni Islam and the Shiite Islam. They like it. 
and they have absolutely no problems with Shiite militias massacring Sunnis in Iraq. <clears throat> because if this conflict, which we see rise with Saudi Arabia attacking in Yemen, with uh, Sunnis and Shiite from various nations attacking each other in Syria these days, we see this conflict rising. And if Daesh is managing to become the defender of the Sunnis, which in Iraq we already see that they tell people, see, the Shiite militias are coming, they will kill you. So better you stay with us. Um, if they even, manage, though, even though they have killed more Sunnis than anybody else almost. Yeah, yeah, but this is, this is something they will not advocate in the propaganda. No. They relabel them as Shiites. Oh, okay. And the pictures or in the, in the videos sometimes, they said we killed the Nusseri Alawite soldiers, but they were Sunni rebels. Um, yeah, problem uh, and of nobody distinct is uniform. there to stand to correct them. No, very few. Uh, because everybody believes the, the pictures. But Christoph, in your book you write about that they use this hashtag... We're talking with uh, Islam Online 3.0 almost. They use this hashtag uh, Sykes Pico over. So, do they want to redraw the borders or erase the borders? Um, yeah, although for now, if the, the, uh, the campaign in Iraq would have been more successful, they would happily have retreated over the Sykes Pico border and say, please don't follow us. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, basically, they want to take the last part uh, I hadn't finished, they want to become the defender of, of the Sunni identity because then attacking Daesh would mean you attack an identity. And an identity mm. people cannot give up. So if they are identical with the Sunni identity, um, it will be extremely difficult to fight them because people are with the back to the wall. Uh, and then we see the real big problem And I think they are heading into this uh, strategic direction. The real big problem. Yeah. And uh, to the hashtag sykes Pico, of course, they want to erase borders um, and redraw, basically, the lines of their empire. And I think the, the natural borders of their planned empire would be Sunni Arab areas. If we see where they were successful, taking over more or less successful in Syria, rather successful in Iraq, completely successless in Shiite areas and Kurdish areas. So Sunni identity, they have made the experience we can manage to take over. At the end of the day, people will surrender. While in, in a Kurdish area or in a Shiite area, people will resist to the last moment. We have either to kill everybody or to, to kick everybody out, but then there is no people you can exploit. So they will not attack Baghdad, for example, but they are opting to go south. Saudi, Jordan, Egypt, Libya, long term, no hurry. Maybe in one year, maybe in two years. Um, but they have been able to decide the <laughs> moment of attack. They decided when they attacked Ramadi. They decided when they took Tatmor. A few more questions before we go to the audience. And you already left... Uh, Sham in your own uh, analysis. Okay, if I sum up, in your book, you want us to understand that this is a rational movement with a clear plan and that they have time and money, uh, instruments to actually establish whatever they want to establish. And I read in your book that you are very critical, at least of the way the US and the Europeans are handling this organization. Well, Maybe not so rational in a way. No, because um, they have first completely underestimated it. And then, like in Iraq now, the Americans are getting closer and closer to getting allied with Shiite militias because they just think, we have to fight them by any means. But this is like uh, someone on the shipwreck decides to drink salt water uh, because at least it's water. But the effect will be uh, counterproductive. And people do not see the strategic foresight, the strategic planning ability of Daesh, and which lets them walk into the trap. And the same would be if European countries would decide, ah, we have to stand with Assad against Daesh. Daesh would say, cool. 
excellent because if the West goes with the Shiites in this case, so the Sunnis will feel like, okay, we, we are with the back to the wall. But they overplayed their cards in a way in Sinjar. Yeah, this was the... Uh, This was the first you time know, when we had the Yazidis withdrawing or fleeing to the mountain, and we all saw these pictures on television. And all of a sudden, the minority card was being played because all of you know in the West we like minorities that need to be protected. No, and I think Daesh at that time underestimated after with impunity rolling through Mosul, rolling through thirty percent of Iraq killing scores of people in Syria, and nobody cared. The worst is that Obama would say, well, we, we should do something about this. Um, but there was never any real reaction. And then suddenly, they uh, ran into August last year. They attacked the Yazidi areas in Sinjar. And in a way, they were outsmarted by the, the Kurdish KDP government of Barzani, which first let basically the Yezidi down by simply retreating all forces and then beating the drums worldwide that the Yezidi are slaughtered and we need weapon supply for us Kurds to defend the well, Yezidi. Well, that has worked before, so smart thinking from their side, not so yeah, solidarity yeah. In a way, oriented. At this moment, they outsmarted Daesh and then we saw this escalation of Daesh thought what to do, so let's kill the hostages. Um, but, for example, they have not resorted to terror attacks in the West. Mm -hmm. They have kept it on a kind of calculated response. We behead James Foley, Sotloff, and a few other hostages. Um, but that's it. All the attacks, the terror attacks we had in Europe, um, there is no identified relation with Daesh. And they were so amateurish in the, in the handling that uh, it wasn't them. But there's one thing I should correct, because it's not that Daesh in total is a completely rational organization. It is a joint venture of, you could say, contradicting elements. You have the cold-blooded planners, and you have the jihadi element. You have the people who, especially the followers, um, who believe, who are willing to be sacrificed, who fight to the last bullets, who don't mind to die in battle. You have these two elements, And Daesh will remain on this path of success if the people who make this balance in the leadership, if they survive, because jihadis you can replace, but uh, former intelligence officers with 30 years of experience, if he is killed, as Haji Bakr was killed, as a few mm -hmm. others were killed, it's not easy to replace them. Mm -hmm. Plus, we don't know in the minds of the Daeshi leadership, uh, they started as a small group, failure after failure, and suddenly now they are running a little empire with millions of people with 100,000 yeah. square kilometers. So it might be that in some of their minds they feel like, oh, God really means it You know, when it, whenever people tell me in the Middle East, uh, yeah, well, never, whenever the people tell me in the Middle East, Rabina Yesahel, God will provide, I'm like, uh-huh, does he collect the garbage? Um, and Daesh, in the end, has to deal with garbage collection as well. Yeah, and uh, well, garbage collection is not the priority, but not yet. <laughs> when you see them, again, we were puzzled because uh, other forces would go on attack. Maybe they would look for the bank uh, of a weapon depot, but yeah. Dash was looking immediately for the grain depots, for the flour mills, for the uh, yeah. animal food storage facilities, for any kind of uh, facilities of strategic importance. Immediately bring everything so under they, control. So they control the bread ovens of the city. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And when they left Aleppo, they took the bread ovens with them. Okay. One last question about the regional actors. I mean, today we discussed Saudi Arabia, we discussed the US, we discussed Turkey. But there is this little country, which some refer to as the Royal Kingdom of Boredom, <laughs> um, But funnily enough, um, this small country, Jordan, has, to your, uh, in your opinion, done things in the right way, at least partly. They somehow managed to deal with the pressure outside of their borders. They have kept their borders more or less closed. What can we learn from this small kingdom? It sounds like a scenario as well. A uh, small kingdom. <laughs> It was our learning curve from a failure, the failure to cross from uh, Jordan into Syria, 
which we tried through Jordan Intelligence, uh, Military Council of Rebels and Terra, Liaison to the Intelligence, Smugglers, etc., etc. We we failed. We completely failed, and we found out that Jordan State obviously has managed. I, I don't say it's not corrupt. It's not power abusive. But Jordan authorities have managed to proceed in a way of we have a policy plan and we implement it. And our policy is we don't want our radicals to cross. We don't want foreign jihadis to come to Jordan and then to go into Syria. Uh, we want to control who is going in and going out. And we try, although Jordan has corruption problems, uh, we try to maintain control that nobody can buy his way through. Um, and this is something, for example, Turkey... They still have tourism. And they still have tourism, yeah. But they don't have Tunisians who would come in January and say they want to uh, go to Syria for tourism. But it is possible to control a border. And Turkey basically... Uh, well, he's no longer here. Uh, Turkey has done, unfortunately, exactly the opposite. They have contradicting uh, political ideas, used jihadis... Um, against the Kurds, have uh, Bashar uh, forced into withdrawal, help the rebels, while at the same time help jihadis who fight the rebels, being corrupt at the border. So they have this enormous problem that Daesh is crossing, and Daesh is like, like a mushroom existing in Turkey by now as well. Yeah. Time for the audience. Time I know audience. you must have a thousand and one questions. <coughs> we will not be able to fulfill that wish, but we have about yeah, half an hour. Um, so who can I... And we will collect two, three questions. Um, okay, I have an agreement with you. Uh, anybody who overstates more than 30 or 45 seconds will donate to Adopt a Revolution, and we will determine the amount, okay? That's probably the... <laughs> The seconds that you take longer. That's a good one, huh? So it's at your own risk. Now, the multimillionaire in the audience who wants to talk at length, please write a book. Um, who can I give the floor? Um, do we have mics? There are three people over here, so the, I can't see you, yeah? And could you stand up and state uh, your, who you are? Yes. Thank you. Hello, um, good evening. Uh, I work uh, in the Federal Foreign Office and I've been to Syria before. And uh, I would like to ask a question on the parallel um, observations that you describe in the book and that were publicized by journalists before that some people said there must be um, more than just similarity between the secret service in Syria and some of the styles that Daesh is a uh, implementing when they uh, interrogate their prisoners or when they try to fight rebels that they want to get rid of, etc. And you have also described in the book um, that uh, here and there there were contacts with the operational people in the secret agencies of Syria. And of course, this is not uh, necessarily enough to say that Assad has invented Daesh, which is probably completely wrong, but how how can we explain this in a little more detail? Why, why were there these points of contact? Um, did they all plan it or were they overwhelmed by some good ideas that developed in wrong directions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll take two more. We, we had a gentleman over there and then we have a... No? Oh, oh that was your question. Then a gentleman <laughs> over here in the front. Uh, no. And, and ladies, well, we already had one lady, so no worries. I only give the word to gentlemen here. Hello. Hi. Um, I used to be a tour operator in Syria. A real one? <laughs> well. <laughs> well, you know, past control now, no, I'm no, becoming no. a bit. <laughs> Before 2011. Okay. <laughs> um, one question. There were some clues that um, Europe nations somehow get oil from um, Daesh operated uh, oil fields. I want to know if that's true and I mean we know that the Syrian regime uh, does a lot of um, open deals with Daesh, let um, trucks pass and um, buys the oil from them. Um, so I want to know if um, that's true or if you can have any clues about that. Okay. And there was one more over there? 
Thank you very much. My name is Janis Hakman. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, you called the, the uh, Daesh, you called them a, a Stasi Caliphate. And I'm wondering, um, that sounds very much like the 80s or 70s. And you don't talk about uh, the cyberspace. Um, do they control the internet? Do they, I mean, because you talk to your sources via Skype or email, um, can you please elaborate on, on their control over the internet? Well, we have a lot of uh, Syria questions, or oh, Assad uh, connections questions, so... Yeah. Um, indeed, they are trying to control the internet in some areas. Um, so people would uh, try, for example, with the G3 um, and their own computer to move to different points to send stuff, not to go to the internet cafes. Uh, or, for example, what we know from Raqqa, that people are opening a new Facebook account for like three hours, contact all their friends, then chat with their friends, and then delete the whole uh, account again. Because they know that somehow uh, either they had to give their password of the other Facebook account to Daesh, or they are afraid of, they know already, Daesh had sent, has sent Trojans to, 99% uh, it was Daesh, to, for example, Raqqa is slaughtered silently, claiming that we are somebody from Canada and we would love to talk to you, etc. Um, so they are trying. They are not super professional, but um, yes, there are reasons for the people to be extremely careful to communicate with us. And one of the reasons also why Daesh was banning traveling, um, or tried to ban it, was that people would simply move out of the caliphate, go to Kirkuk, email everything, talk to people, collect money, do this and this and this, and come back. And they don't want this. They want to have control over their people. As a moderator, I can have a footnote question. Sure. For me, it doesn't make sense. They want to go back in their ideology, at least the jihadis, to this glorious period of the 7th century, of the early days of the Prophet. There was no internet, there were no GPS systems, there were no satellite telephones. How, I mean, they forbid almost everything. They ruin statues because they don't want idols. I mean, how, I mean, you ask this question yourself, how do they reconcile this contradiction? You know, the modernity of 2015 that serves them well yeah. and wanting to go back to the origin of time. Well, you would have two answers. The one is there are, also in Saudi Arabia, there are theological debates, what is a bidah? What is a forbidden innovation? Uh, and what is a legitimate uh, innovation. In Saudi, this discussion has changed from trucks, cars, television were first shot at, or you had heavy demonstrations. Um, you have such discussions also in some circles of Daesh, but for probably 95% of rank and file, they simply don't care. Uh, they wait what the emir says, and when the emir says, frozen chicken is forbidden, Frozen chicken is forbidden. When the emir says, and it happened in Mosul years ago, uh, veggie salad. No tomatoes, no cucumbers. No tomatoes, no cucumbers, because male and female vegetables should not mix in the olive oil. <laughs> um, you have you get, an idea, <laughs> which is the male veggie. <laughs> yes. um, they say, okay, okay, we, we, will, we will take care of this. Um, they simply don't care. They love to have the power. They love to have the power to tell everybody, forbidden, 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 and I can punish you at any given time. Um, so, there is, um, it doesn't matter. I mean, you had, you had one guy who was stopped because he had a spare tire in his trunk. And the jihadi, the dashi said to him, you're not permitted to have a spare tire in your trunk. You don't trust Allah that all your four tires will work well. And when the other guys, said, well, what's the difference between the spare tire and the other tire? There were no tires in Mohammed's time. He was beaten up and uh, sent away. It, this is too much thinking for most of them. They okay. are not into these elaborate ways. Um, but Going to the yeah. Assad connection. No, well, first the other. Ah. There is no, see, Daesh is selling oil to everybody who buys. Even the hardcore friendly rebels who fight Daesh sell Dash filter and Dash non-filter diesel uh, in their little shops. Because everybody needs diesel, everybody buys, everybody sells. It's a war economy, and yes, the regime is the biggest buyer, but also the others buy. But Europe, 
No, Europe is not in the market. It's all Turkey, Kurdistan, Syrian rebels, Syrian government, but the amounts are not so big and this is all local. Plus, Daesh governs an area or controls an area where they need quite a lot of diesel on their own. Um, so there is not so much left to export. Plus, the refineries are bombed all the time. Uh, coming to the question was um, the, the useful enemy or the frenemy. It's a long historical um, uh, joint venture. If you go back to 2003, you had the busloads of people going from Syria to Iraq, first to as human shields, and then to fight there. Syrians would say, no, no, there are no buses going to Iraq, uh, just buses were going. And then it became more elaborate, and over time, about 90% of all foreign suicide bombers in Iraq came through Syria. Al-Qaeda in Iraq was having their, their pipeline through Syria with the full coordination and support of the intelligence services with one main reason in the beginning, to stop Americans, or to stop Bush's government from doing regime change again. And the reason was not unfounded. Rumsfeld and co. had the idea, oh, Iraq was so easy, let's roll to Damascus. Um, plus, they had found out that Damascus had helped uh, Saddam militarily, at least with supplies. Um, so Damascus wanted to make sure there will be no uh, there will be no second American adventure to make uh, uh, by making life hell for the Americans. And they they kind of discovered how useful terrorism is. So, uh, the international community wants you to leave uh, Lebanon in 2005. So, suddenly there was a terror organization emerging in Tripoli on the refugee camp Nahr al-Barit. Um, out of a sudden you had Fatah al-Islam fighting against Lebanese army and making life difficult for them. Suddenly this group disappeared again. Um, terrorism was seen as too important to leave it to the terrorists. And they have... Ali Mamluk and the other uh, generals of intelligence have over years developed relations with people. They would go into jail, they would be left out of jail. Uh, we talked to several defected intelligence officers who said even back to 99 to 2000, it was very depressing because we arrested a terrorist group. And then they said, no, 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 sorry, but you, you cannot do this because we are funded by the military intelligence. Uh, or we, we had somebody standing on the roof, we had found explosive in the house, etc., etc., and we just wanted to shoot him. And he said, Yasaidi, Yasaidi, wait, please, could you call the head of the political intelligence because uh, I'm on their payroll? Um, why, but following up on this one and your explanation, why is it so hard for so many people in the West, also policymakers and politicians, to see that there is maybe not a smoking gun, but all of the definitely circumstantial evidence that Assad has been instrumental in the beginning of the successes of Daesh. Because they see the surface, because they see the videos. If you take the, uh, the answer of German intelligence to a Kleine Anfrage, to a question in the parliament, how many Al-Qaeda related attacks have been in Syria in 2011, late 2011, they said oh, about 90. All their knowledge derived from watching the video selection of the site monitoring service, who also delivers the, uh, the translation with it. Uh, when you talk to them, or when they give briefing to my colleagues, they would say, yeah, no, there was this bombing, and this bombing, and this bombing, and we've seen the videos. We've seen the videos. We have seen the videos of the Al-Nusra front. Um, it was a perfectly calculated, invented image of overall jihadi organization, but looking on the ground, what really happened, you would not find this organization. It simply did not exist at that time. But the problem is, if you don't go in, if you watch the video, uh, if you watch their declarations, Al-Qaeda has declared so and so, we have done this and this and this, um, people, even including intelligence service, tend to believe this. And it's simply, very difficult for the mindset of people here to imagine that official arch enemies would cooperate or that the regime of Bashar al-Assad 
would sacrifice one to intelligence building to be blown up to make the case that the terrorists are here. More questions. Um, I saw we have Hanin here. We yeah. Hanin here, and then there's an, a, a gentleman <coughs> in the back, and somebody in front. I'm sorry, it's a bit dark, so I can't see. And then somebody here. We'll take four. Is that okay? Hanin. Uh, just a very brief question. In your opinion, personal opinion, is it possible to defeat the ISIS, Daesh? And if the answer is yes, what is the best way? I'm really sorry for this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, will, you have some time to think. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we can go from the front till the back. Hello, Jason Zajic, my name, freelance journalist for Vice magazine, formerly working for Taz. Um, just a question, um, all international newspapers have been reporting about the use and abuse and um, the production and export of Captagon. I did not find anything in Spiegel so far. Um, could you just tell me if your personal experience, were they on speed? Because the Lebanese drugs authorities, they seized 12 million pills last year coming Talking from... Drugs here. Well, drugs for ISIS, because yeah, yeah. you need some kind of drugs, I think, to be that cruel or to be that talkative or to be that energetic. Well, it's on the rise. Before, um, Syria was an importing nation for Captagon from Lebanon. Lebanon was producing. Now, it seems, Guardian wrote it last year, that the production now is taking place in Syria for the export for the Gulf states. So I was just wondering, um, I'm sure you know much about it. I'm curious. Please share your knowledge. Okay. <laughs> I don't know whether the drugs are the solution to the problem, but... Uh <laughs> <laughs> Mirko Fossen from Fire University. I have a question regarding the foreign fighters. Uh, you, I mean, it's something very unique to Daesh, these, uh, all these foreign fighters. And how do you integrate them into the surveillance society you just described? And then we have a few more questions in the back. We'll take them as well, and then we do a last round. Well, four, four would be fine. Yeah. Otherwise, I am lost. Yeah. Okay. Nothing to write. Schönen guten Tag. Mein Name ist äh, Jumal Imol. Ich bin äh, türkischer Staatsbürger und äh, habe meinen Militärdienst noch nicht geleistet. Deshalb interessiert mich äh, eine <coughs> Frage: äh, Die IS-Ideologie. Wie sieht der IS sozusagen Muslime, die keinen Treueschwur geleistet haben? Sehen Sie diese Leute als Kuffar, als Ungläubige oder sehen Sie die als Muslime, deren Herzen man gewinnen muss? Für eine Antwort wäre ich Ihnen sehr dankbar. Aber die Geschichte mit den Gurken und den Ersatzreifen, das, das entspricht nicht der Wahrheit. Vielen Dank. Welche Geschichte mit, die Geschichte mit Gurken und Tomaten? Ach so. Okay, ja. okay. the floor okay. is yours. Okay. Um. Nein, die Geschichte mit den Gurken und den Tomaten wurde damals geglaubt und bestätigt von Leuten aus Mosul, ähm, wo, es, wo das damals ähm, veröffentlicht wurde. Was ein interessanter Begriff ist, um sozusagen am Ende anzufangen, es gibt bei Daesh oder in den Gegenden den Begriff der Neumuslime, weil sie sagen, ihr müsst im Prinzip alle noch einmal, noch einmal Muslime werden. Ähm, ihr Ihr seid zwar im Prinzip Muslime seit tausend Jahren, ich meine Nordsyrien war eines der ersten Gebiete oder Syrien überhaupt, ähm, aber sie wollen eine Art Reenactment durchführen, den Islam abermals einzuführen. Und in ihren Augen, ähm, ein, ein wirklicher Muslim ist erst jemand, der ihnen jetzt die Treue geschworen hat, weil sie argumentieren, wir haben ja die Khilafa, wir haben das Kalifat. Also wenn du ein guter Muslim bist, dann ein wahrer, dann hast du uns die Treue zu schwören, weil das ist ja Teil des, das ist Teil von, von Gottes Geboten. Ähm, wer das nicht tut, ist deswegen kein, kein Kafir oder kein, kein Murtad, solange er nicht gegen sie kämpft, sondern ist einfach jemand, der noch auf den richtigen Weg gebracht werden muss. Also man kann in Raqqa auch überleben, ohne die Baya zu schwören. Aber die Argumentation ist, wenn sie in Dörfer gehen, dass sie sagen, ähm, wenn ihr zeigen wollt, dass ihr wirkliche Muslime seid, dann erwarten wir die Bayer, dann erwarten wir den Treue, den Treueeid von euch. Ähm, zur Frage. Just, just one follow up on that one. This struck me. This whole thing with wie, wie nennt man das auf Deutsch? Ablasse? Ja, yeah, so you could actually buy 
Is a different thing. That's it. You can die of your sin. Like okay, we yeah. we'll do that later. Um, wie man die ausländischen Kämpfer integriert. Die Let's uh, continue in English. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, How to integrate the foreign fighters? It's um, it's not so difficult to integrate foreign fighters because foreign fighters are depending on their hosts, which in this case is Daesh. Um, it's much more complicated for Daesh to integrate locals to integrate Syrian fighters. And uh, there were some large rebel groups in, uh, in Idlib or Aleppo who would sometimes send a group of them to infiltrate Daesh, basically uh, that five or ten guys would say, hey, we like you better, we want to be with you. These fighters or these guys would be immediately sent to the other edge of the empire to Mosul or to Hawija or to the front line in Kobani or somewhere, they would never be deployed in the same area they come from because uh, Daesh was skeptical about their real affiliation and to, to keep them under control, they would move people from A to B to C. The same they are moving, for example, their, their district emirs every few months from place to place to place that nobody can build up his fiefdom his personal power base. This is something they absolutely want to prevent. Um, but 20 French, one German or six German, 20 Belgians, one Finn, uh, 50 Tunisians. Either they have them in groups together or they are mixed, but they go through a period of training. They go through a period of surveillance, of talking to them. Um, so Daesh makes clear or tries to find out, okay, are they real? Do they have references we can call? We've, we found application letters of people who gave all the telephone numbers of their bomb building instructor, their sheikh, etc. to Daesh. So they could be called to uh, give some, some testimony about him. But they remain pretty low on the food chain, don't they? Yeah, no, absolutely. Foreigners are cannon fodder or PR people mainly, except Tunisians and Saudis mainly. They they mm. grow in the higher ranks in the mid management basically. But, but the non Arabic speaking German, Dutch, Danish. The Europeans. The Europeans. Chechens are a different ball game because Chechens have a reputation to fight and Chechen. Chechen have this glamorous uh, reputation to be the, the hardcore jihad. They don't need drugs. No, they don't need drugs. Coming to the drugs, um, we, we never wrote about it because nobody was able to show us the pills. We have plenty of people... No, I mean, you would have, you would have, a, you would have a Dash car or you would have a Dashi who was shot. And they said, well, we shot this Dashi and in his trousers he had 15 pills. I was like, okay, okay, show us the pills. Well, we gone. Um, the, it's like in German you would say there is the, the spider in the yucca palm. Um, that these guys are always drugged is the, the ever recurring theme idea. So it's like there's a Zionist conspiracy or there's a Freemason conspiracy. The Dashis are all drugged. Uh, I, don't I don't say it's not true. But we never reported about it simply because no evidence. And uh, if somebody would give us, here, this is the pills we found, or we would be close to an attack and see that what was with the body of this guy, um, then we would examine what was found and would write about it. But you have specific topics where everybody loves to talk about. And the experiences of Kurdish fighters or others who saw Dashis running up to them and one guy told us, well, I shot him in the, in the arm. He kept running. I shot him again, and I had to shoot his head off to stop him, which is unusual. So they, they believe these people must be drugged, and probably in many cases they are. But evidence. No evidence. So now we have the $1 million question yeah. by Hani. Uh, How to solve this? Deal with it. It's the... Uh, it may sound odd to many, not to you, not to me, but... Um, I think if you want to stop Daj in their safe haven, and uh, for now this is Syria, um, maybe even more than Iraq, if you want to stop them there, or there it would be easier to stop them if you take out the family of Assad. You take out Jamil Hassan, you take out the people whom basically you could put into two airplanes, send them to Sochi, and from what... 
You're so nice. That's quite nice over there. I don't know if living under Putin is so nice in the long run. Um, no, but what we know from secret negotiations, for example, humanitarian dialogue, this kind of clandestine UN-styled uh, center, which brought, in a very elaborate way, brought people of both sides together. It was already more than a year ago that regime supporters, opposition, uh, agreed on, we can keep on fighting, yes. We can destroy everything, yes. And then what? And they were rather close to, okay, let's, let's find any way to stop it. Both sides are willing to compromise, but only without Assad um, for the opposition. And uh, while the opposition probably would even accept somebody like Ali Mamluk as somehow some powerful person. Um, you have to explain to oh, sorry, people who don't know This is the head of Ali Mamluk state Mamluk security and like the, the highest intelligence general in Syria. And who allegedly man, had house arrest recently, but we don't no, know whether no, that's true. No. Okay. No, he is Maybe Ill. that was wishful thinking. Of somebody. I'm afraid this was wishful thinking. No, he is ill, obviously. A uh, chain smoker. Rothman king size filter, um, but uh, there is no. You do have good sources, my. <laughs> the head, the head of his cleaning team. Okay. Um, no, really. Um, no, there is no, there is no evidence that he is under house arrest, and the accusation, or the, the, the suspicion that he was conspiring with the Turks, etc., would be bollocks because he is the man of Tehran. He is the man of Iran in Damascus. So if he wants to conspire with anybody against Bashar, he would conspire with the Iranians simply to replace Bashar, but not with the Turks. Um, now, you have, the, you have the willingness on both sides to stop the, to stop the bloodshed, to stop the, the total destruction of the country, because both people in both camps know that this is going nowhere except into total destruction. And then uh, you have a second thing which pisses off both camps, and this is they don't like to be subjugated by the foreigners. The regime people don't like the Iranians telling them do this, do this, do this. They don't like Hezbollah telling them this is our checkpoint, or this is our chain of command. They don't like it. Uh, while the Sunnis don't like Daesh, they don't like uh, these jihadi foreigners, who have no respect for uh, local values, or who tell the Syrians, we bring Islam to you. And they say, well, we are Muslims. Um, so they could, in these rounds in Lausanne, they could agree on, yeah, we should get rid of all these foreigners. Um, but as long as the family is there, it won't happen. So once you have a Syria half destroyed, but where people could, uh, under the umbrella of Iran, Russia, the US, agreeing on some kind of salvation of the remnants of Syria, then you could bring people together and really fight Daesh, which you cannot do for now. Where you still wonder, how could Daesh, without being monitored by the regime, make it through half the country into Sweda in the south? Uh, how could they drive into Tatmor while no rebel ever had the chance to reach the area because it's flat desert and they shoot you on 10 kilometers distance? Uh, we at least may wonder. Um, this is the way to fight them in Syria. For Iraq, it's much more complicated. Uh, it's basically left to the Iraqis to destroy their own country. And nobody from outside can stop it. It's the Iraqis' decision. Um, but at least whatever happens in Iraq, you could stop it for Syria. And in Syria, you have the most important clientele for fighting Daesh, and this is Sunni Arabs. They have to be defeated from within the clientele, from within the community, because it's the only way. Sorry, one thing. It's the only way there is no space left open for Daesh to say, "Oh, it's the Murtadin, it's the the infidels, the uh, the Shiites, the non-believers attacking us." No, it's it's their own Sunnis. They don't mind killing Sunnis, but they have nothing in terms of ideology to tell the Sunnis. So in Syria, you have Sunnis who hate Daesh, who fight Daesh, um, plenty of them, but they also want to fight Assad. So you have to do both. You cannot say, okay, until Tuesday you have to fight Daesh and maybe then we change. You have to do both. Um, and it has to, Daesh will be defeated from within the Sunni community. Otherwise, it will not be defeated. I promised two people in the back. We'll take those questions. I'm sorry, I have... We, I like to do some good timekeeping for people who uh, have buses and trains and whatever to catch. 
Um, so can I have the two people in the back, the lady and then this gentleman behind the lady? Okay. Uh, is it possible to ask the question in German? Of course. Okay. It's for Dali. Shukran. Die sind zwei Fragen in eins. Um, uh, Erstmal, also wie interpretieren Sie, uh, dass uh, Daesh, also oder die, 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 die Mitglieder oder die, die um, Akteure von Daesh auf dem Boden in Syrien, dass sie aus vielen verschiedenen Nationalitäten von der Welt und um, wie, also die zentrale Frage, die viele Sura beschäftigt äh, und da äh, also im vier, im vier Jahr, in den letzten Jahren so zu beobachten, findet man auch viele Hinweise auf die finanzielle Frage. Wie finanziert sich Daesh? Warum haben diese Söldner, also ich oder viele Sura bezeichnen die als Söldner? Äh, wie kriegen sie diese hohen Gehalte? Das ist ganz sicher, dass äh, die äh, Daesh äh, kein Mitglied in Daesh oder Aktur in Daesh, der nicht einen hohen Gehalt bekommt oder besten Waffen. Und woher das, woher kommt das alles? Also okay, danke. In nur also von Sicht dem das war Sucher, schon das fünf ist nicht Fragen nur, und das nee, ist, das glaub, ist eine ist Frage nur, das ist nicht nur regional, sondern international. Und ich möchte nur, äh, also das ist nur fragen, wie, wie, wie sehen Sie das äh, mit der Finanzierung und mit den vielen Nationalitäten, die Okay, danke. Äh, danke. Guten Abend, ich bin Raman Kalaf, ein syrischer Aktivist und äh, ich will jetzt so nur einfach das Regime ins Licht bringen. Ähm, wie Sie wissen, Herr Reuter, dass das Assad-Regime ähm, existiert seit 40 Jahren. Sie haben das Libanon bis kurzem auch besetzt. Sie haben die verschiedenen ähm, Spieler und Beteiligte in Libanon kontrolliert. Äh, Sie haben auch die palästinensische Frage irgendwie die, die Spieler äh, unterstützt und äh, niedergeschlagen auch. Und in Syrien. Ähm, ähm, nach 2004 auch im Irak haben sie viele ähm, rechtes, äh, extreme Organisationen in, ins Irak geschickt und sie haben damals mit dem Amerikaner gehandelt. Also ähm, die Frage, die Frage, die Frage <lacht> ist, dass Assad eigentlich einen ungeheuren, noch scheußlichen Monster schaffen wollte, damit wir seine ähm, ähm, Unmischlichkeit oder damit wir zum Vergleich kommen. Und dass damit die Westen sagen, also kleinerer Obel. Ähm, meinen Sie, wenn, wenn, wenn die Westen, Sie haben in Ihrem Buch, im Buch auch das an ein paar Stellen beschrieben, dass äh, irgendwie da von, von Assad unterstützt wird. Ähm, dass die Westen wissen das. Warum dann äh, äh, greifen Sie Assad nicht doch? Lachen Sie unser, also die westliche Gesellschaften aus? Lachen Sie Ihre eigenen Gesellschaften aus? Wie sieht es aus? Wie, was sagen Sie dazu? Okay, danke schön. Wir können auf Deutsch enden, nicht? Oder Englisch, was du möchtest. Ach, nee, egal. Ja. Dann mal auf Deutsch? Ja, warum okay. nicht? Ähm, es ist eben, es ist komplizierter. Assad hat nicht Daesh ins Leben gerufen. Er hat sie nicht geschaffen. Sie existierten vorher. Äh, Baghdadi existierte vorher. Ähm, es gibt ein ganz schönes Beispiel, wo man äh, ganz gut schildern kann, wie Daesh seine, seine zeitweiligen Allianzen wechselt. Äh, Im Januar 2014, als die Kämpfe zwischen Rebellen und Daesh ausbrachen, hat Daesh Raqqa zurückerobert oder gänzlich wieder eingenommen. Und es gibt eine, ein Militärlager, Forge Sabah Daesh, Division 17, die liegt oder lag neben Raqqa war von Rebellen belagert, die konnte nie versorgt werden aus der Luft, aus, mit Hubschraubern, weil die immer Angst hatten, dass sie abgeschossen werden. Dann hat der Hisbollah-Sender Manar TV ein Team begleitet vom ersten Versorgungsflug. Division 17 wurde wieder aus der Luft versorgt. Es war wieder sicher. Offensichtlich hatte Daesh nichts dagegen, dass diese, dieses Militärlager wieder versorgt wurde. Und der Beleg war diese... Jubelsendung von glücklichen Soldaten, die ihre, ihre Essenspakete bekamen. So, sechs Monate später, Daesh hatte den Irak überrollt, hatte Waffen ohne Ende dort erbeutet, war mächtig genug. Was haben sie getan? Als erstes haben sie Division 17 überfallen und alle Soldaten niedergemetzelt. Ähm, das ist dieses, 
äh, oszillierende, wechselnde Verhältnis. Sie sind Feinde und sie sind einander nützliche Feinde. Solange sie einander benutzen können und brauchen können, tun sie einander nichts. Aber wenn sie sich mächtig genug fühlen, wie in diesem Falle da in Ostsyrien, ab Juni letzten Jahres, dann überfallen sie die Regimeposten, die sie vorher beschützt haben. Und das Regime würde wahrscheinlich genau dasselbe tun, wenn es das Gefühl hätte, jetzt sind wir stark genug und es ist nur noch Daesh übrig geblieben als Gegner, nicht mehr die Rebellen, dann würden sie bis auf die Leute, die auf ihrer Payroll stehen, im Zweifelsfall die Leute dort umbringen. Ähm, das ist keine, das ist nichts, was komplett geschaffen wurde oder keine, keine Allianz für die Ewigkeit, sondern das sind Zeit, das sind Perioden, wo sie denken, okay, jetzt nutzt es mir und wenn es mir nicht mehr nutzt, dann zack, überfalle ich die Leute, die ich gestern noch beschützt habe. Damit haben sie überhaupt kein Problem. Ähm, zu der Frage von Ihnen ähm, über die, die Finanzierung. Ähm, es, ist, es gibt keine oder wenig Belege dafür, dass Daesh einen oder ganz große Finanziers hat, die gigantische Summen dorthin schicken. Das hat Daesh auch schon vor der Revolution, vor 2011 nicht getan, sondern die hatten damals ein, die waren die Mafia von Mosul und bis hin zum, zum Bestatter, zum Grundstücksmakler, zum Apotheker, zum Moschee, jeder musste Schutzgeld zahlen und wenn man kein Schutzgeld zahlte, wurde man entweder erschossen oder der Laden flog in die Luft. Also die ganzen Malls und äh, selbst Apotheken, die in Mosul gesprengt wurden bis 2011 oder 2012, ähm, das waren im Wesentlichen da äh, Schutzgelderpressung. Die haben zwölf oder mehr Millionen Dollar pro Monat allein damit eingenommen und haben sich selbst finanziert. Und der Weg, wie sie sich heute finanzieren, ähm, ist... So, äh, Lass mich eben zu Ende kommen. Äh, der Weg, wie sie sich heute finanzieren, sie pressen ihre eigenen Untertanen aus. Sie haben fünf bis acht Millionen Menschen unter ihrer Kontrolle. Ein kleines Beispiel, der nicht ganz arme Ort Al-Bab äh, im Osten der Provinz Aleppo. Reiche Viehhändler, Leute, die relativ viel Geld verdient haben, Geschäftsleute. Da ging Daesh zu den etwas Wohlhabenderen im Sommer, Herbst letzten Jahres und sagte... Wir müssen schätzen. Du musst uns sagen, was dir gehört, weil wir ja die Sakat, die, die Almosensteuer von 5% erheben müssen. Sag uns einfach, was dir gehört und dann schicken wir dir in ein paar Wochen den Bescheid. 99% der Leute haben natürlich weniger angegeben, als sie haben. Dann kamen die Dashis zwei Tage später wieder und sagten, Bruder, du hast uns ja angelogen. Du hast uns ja gar nicht erzählt, dass dieses Haus und dieses Haus und diese Weide und diese Schafherde dir auch noch gehören. Und Bruder, wir haben mal die Transaktionen von dir in der Bank und bei dem Havala Office gecheckt. Du hast ja viel mehr Geld verdient, als du uns gesagt hast. Bruder, du hast gesündigt. Und jetzt müssen wir deinen gesamten Besitz konfiszieren. Und das haben sie in Al-Bab reihenweise mit Leuten gemacht. Sie pressen die eigene Bevölkerung aus weil sie wissen, wem was gehört und weil sie es eben können, weil die Leute sich nicht mehr wehren können. Nein, aber wenn man... Ähm, okay. Nein, nein, nein. Okay, ganz kurz. <lacht> ganz ähm, kurz. Entschuldigung, Entschuldigung. Entschuldigung, nee, nee, wir haben hier... I'm sorry, I'm the moderator here. You, you made your point, sir, 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 we didn't give you the microphone. We heard your voice. We are almost at the end. Sorry, we had a deal. You will, I uh, come, no, 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 no. I no. come to Saudi Arabia. Just you, can I we please to listen Arabia. to the uh, gentleman here, to Christoph? Yeah. I come to Saudi Arabia because it's an interesting point. Um, it's I've, I want to actually get permission from the audience. Do you mind if we continue five more minutes to finish this point? Is that okay? Yeah, because I don't want one person to take over, even not in this room. I'm sorry, um, I'm not going to take any other questions. I got strict instructions about time. <laughs> your, no, Saudi your Arabia is an, is an interesting point because seeing how Saudi Arabia is functioning with the same catalog of punishments, beheading, uh, cutting of limbs for, uh, for stealing, women wailed, women banned from driving. It looks very similar to Daesh in many aspects, and it is very similar to Daesh in some aspects. 
Um, but this does not mean that the kingdom, the government, the ruling family is supporting Daesh because they are extremely afraid of Daesh as a competitor, as somebody they cannot fight ideological telling, saying that Daesh is barbarian uh, because they are so similar. So you have, you have rich private persons who have supported or are still supporting Daesh. Some of them go to Kuwait because it's easier to send money from there because Saudi authorities are after people who are financing Daesh. Not because they hate the ideology, because simply they fear this competition for power. Because Daesh could very easily replace the ruling family in Saudi Arabia and you would not need to change much of the ideology. It's hardcore Sunni, it's Wahhabi, um, but the idea that because they are so similar, they would support it. No, explicitly wrong. And for Qatar and others, they have financed a Nusra, but there is no evidence simply that these states, any state, has supported Daesh. Christoph, this was, as they call it in German, is this Buch, the Daesh Buch. Fly on your microphone? Is there? I don't know, that must be some s spying fly. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we had a very long day, very interesting, and for people who haven't been able to attend the whole day, they might have missed some elements as the lady over there, but we've discussed the role of Saudi Arabia, of the European Union, of the, the states. Interestingly enough, Israel hasn't been mentioned, maybe that could be another conference. I'm sure you have plenty of ideas for follow-up conferences, but as this is a book presentation, I have a very simple request. I hope you will fulfill it because you have an amazing voice in writing, but also when you read out loud what you've written. So I would very much like to have the last sentences of your book read to us as a closing statement. Would you mind doing that? Yeah, I looked it up for you here. <laughs> yeah, this is your charming moderator. I keep it short. It's the, the, the last, last part of the, uh, of the last part. Um, dieses Buch kann nur eine Momentaufnahme sein. Es hat sich eher der Entstehung und dem Aufstieg des IS gewidmet und kann darüber hinaus nur Szenarien der weiteren Entwicklung skizzieren, aber keine exakte Prognose stellen. Deshalb seien die letzten Sätze einem Mann überlassen, der am irakischen Rand des Kalifats lebt, vor Furcht seinen Namen nicht zitiert sehen möchte, aber eine ebenso ernüchternde wie ermutigende Langzeitperspektive sieht. Zitat, vor uns liegt das dunkle Zeitalter des Islam. Und das ist gut so. Eine Errettung von außen wäre falsch. Wir müssen den Terror der Islamisten durchleben. Nur so werden die Menschen erkennen, dass Glauben und Politik eine tödliche Mischung sind, die zu nichts anderem führt als einem Machtmissbrauch im Namen Gottes. That's the. That's your applause. Thank you all for being here. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung and the Adopt the Revolution team, all the people behind the scenes who made this possible, the translators over there. There was a request, please fill out the evaluation form. Um, and I'm sure that Christoph is willing to sign the books that are for sale over there, if I'm not mistaken. This, I am a writer, my, I'm a writer myself. Please buy the book. It's worthwhile reading. Um, and on that note, I wish you a pleasant, safe trip back home. And thank you all for being here. And thank you, Christoph and everybody. <laughs>